Conversation with Ron McLean. Welcome to In Conversation. Coming up, the DeBrusques, Louis and Jake, father and son. How many fathers and sons do you think have played in the National Hockey League since its inception in 1917? For an example, brother acts. There have been 47 great brother acts in the NHL, and I thought, well, if there's 47 brother acts, father and son, for a son to follow in his dad's footsteps a generation or two removed, maybe that's more rare. But in fact, it's happened four times as often as brother acts. Did you know there's been 191 fathers and sons play in the NHL, and it's really on the uptick. There's 61 players right now either in the NHL or on the margins in the American Hockey League playing. So I thought, well, is that the socioeconomics changing? In fact, the game's costly. The fact you need tutoring in this highly skilled game. But then Craig Simpson sent me a neat note, and his son Dylan has played in the NHL, Craig's. He said, I'm thinking about Louis DeBrusque. He was a good hockey parent, you know, Ron. Never overboard, never overbearing, never overreactive, just thoughtful messages. Maybe it's the advice the kids are getting. Is that how you fight your way to the NHL? We're about to find out. Louis DeBrus, big tough guy. Gloves and sticks are down. Crowds all out of their chairs. Fans absolutely love it. And Louis DeBrus of the Oilers and Marty McSorley of the Kings going at one another. Louis DeBrus is 6'1", 225 pounds. I watched some of his, uh, obviously his fights. And, um... Yeah, he was a heavyweight, that's for sure. Work into the middle for Krejci, back to even straight. Jake DeBrusque is on the board! His first National Hockey League goal! Your son makes the National Hockey League and scores in his NHL debut. Good for you, big man. Well, listen, kiddo, get the feet going. I don't want to have to say bad things about you tonight. Hey, thanks a lot. Good luck, all right, kiddo? Thanks, all right. Later. And there they are, Jake and Louie. It's so great to have you on the show today. And uh, just seeing a clip a moment ago of your interview on February the 20th, where you were having fun with one another. Uh, Jake, your decision to go uh, back up to Edmonton. I'd love to know what that's about. Yeah, no, I mean, it, uh, it took me a while. Obviously, I love Boston. But, uh, you know, there's a couple things. You know, obviously, being home with the family is priority right now. And an Easter dinner was the reason why I came back. It was, uh, it was thrown on the table. So I, uh, I took the bait. Yeah, we baited him pretty aggressively with that. Mama Bear's been on him to come back for a while, and uh, the turkey finally did it. Yeah. Oh, Cindy. Well, I love to Cindy and Jordan, too, but here's a note from Craig Simpson that I just think is fantastic, and I know he's a dear pal of yours, Louie. Uh, he said, I'm glad you're having Jake and Louie on. I thought it was great when Lou was able to come back here to Edmonton and get Jake settled into minor hockey here. I always thought you could tell Jake loved to play the game and get out on the ice and experiment and try little things. He seemed to gravitate to the puck. Jake and my son Riley played together on the Southside Athletic Club in Midget. Always felt Lou was a good hockey parent too. Not overboard, not overbearing, not overreactive, but thoughtful messages. Uh, so Jake, tell me about your dad. You, you did with Scott Oak. You, you had a beautiful story about him just saying every shift's a gift. Enjoy the game. But tell me about dad and, and your mom for that matter and how they got you to the Boston Bruins. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a pretty good summary to be honest. I, uh, you know, pop a simmer there. But, um, you know, like you said, you know, he wasn't really too, too hard on me, I guess, in a sense. He wasn't a crazy hockey dad or um, he was pretty normal. And obviously just you know, I think what I said earlier on, on uh, After Hours was, you know, he just wanted me to have fun. He just wanted me to uh, follow my passion, whatever that was, and it just turned out to be hockey. You know, I wanted to be like him. And, um, you know, we did move around a lot when we were younger, but they put me in positions to succeed, whether that was in, um, you know, Edmonton minor hockey or even coming from Phoenix. So, um, you know, I always wanted to play hockey just because of how much I saw how much he loved the game, and uh, I just kind of came full circle. So... Um, definitely a good uh, hockey parent to have, uh, you know, throughout my whole life. Yeah. I was shocked, Louis, to know there's 191 fathers and sons have made it to the NHL, and there's 61 right now are either in the league or right on the margins in the American Hockey League. Do you think it's because here, you know, Jake's been around all these great influences, or do you think it's just kind of that advice that you're able to give that no other parent? I mean, 61 is an incredible number. Yeah, it is incredible, and I think I think it's going to grow even more. And, and I, I think you hit the nail right in the head, Ron. I do believe, and I've heard Keith Kachuk talk about this too, um, for Matthew and Brady. They're around the game from a, from a very early age, and they're just embedded in that that lifestyle. Um, they're in the dressing room. I mean, these guys would be you know clashing sticks in the dressing room. One would get a bloody nose, would come, we dust them off, and we throw them right back into the fight. But it's what they knew. They've been around this right from an early age, and. You know, I think he said it best when I talked to him the one day. He said, they've been preparing for this from an early age. Um, when he says, I never pushed him into hockey. It was actually my wife, Cindy, that, that got him his first equipment, first skates, put him in skating down in Arizona. 
and, and, and pushed him onto the ice and, and said, okay, if you want to be like dad, this is how you have to skate. And then when, when he started to play, I came into a little bit more. But to be honest with you, I think that passion and fire was there right from an early age. And that was just from being around in the situation and seeing it every day, just thinking that was normal. Who are some of the ones you uh, love to be around, Jake? Uh, like players? Yeah. Who were the um, ones that you uh, looked up to too? Aside yeah. from dad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a, there's definitely a couple. Cause I, I do remember being around the room and stuff like that, but I probably see the one that had the most impact was Ryan Jones actually for them. It's and uh, mm-hmm. Jonesy was a really cool guy. And I think you guys are hunting buddies at the time. And um, I loved his hair. He had the long flow going on there. And um, <laughs> I think one, one pregame skate, we were just kind of, I was just sitting there with my dad, just watching it. And he kind of, you know, sp- you know, took a stick and like I am Sparta and launched one up in the stands and grabbed me one. And just how casual he was with everything, I thought was pretty cool. And I was kind of, what age was I around that time? Probably you 14, you know, 13, 14. So I was in that range where um, I just thought he was a really cool guy and uh, someone that I looked up to for sure. Made a big impression on him. And the other thing too that, that made an impression was the celebrations. <laughs> Brian Jones, every goal that he scored, he celebrated big time. And obviously, Jake likes to celebrate too. So I think he got a little bit of that from him too. Yeah. Uh, it, well, let's go to your first goal, Louis, first. Uh, you remember you and McTavish against Vancouver. Uh, I don't remember your celly. You'll probably remember it better than me. But tell me about your first. Yeah, you know what? It's always special. I know I was a tough guy. That was a role that I played, but you still wanted to play the game. You still wanted to score a goal. It took me, I believe, 10 games to score my first one, and I knew it was coming right from the get-go. That, that's the one thing about the story for me, though, is we were up in the game, and I knew when that puck got chipped out by Kelly Buckberger to Craig McTavish, it was a two-on-one with him and I, I 100% knew that puck was coming to me, so I was prepared for it. And he made a beautiful backhand pass you know, through the defender, right on the tape. All I had to do was literally elevate into the open net. But uh, you never forget that. That was an amazing moment, and uh, I'll never forget it. It was a special moment for me in my career. And the the one that he scored was more special for me, to be honest with you. Seeing that first goal was, uh, to me, one of the most special things ever I've ever seen in the game. Well, there's your hands, right? Uh, You know, uh, Akil Thomas, who scored the game-winning goal for Canada at the World Junior Championships in Czech Republic, got in and did just what you did, Jake. He did unbelievable play at the net in tight quarters, just like you did. You and Krejci, I don't know what it was with you two, but uh, he said, what were you thinking was the question. He said, well, I wasn't thinking. It was I put in all the reps, and it just kind of happened. And that goal, your first goal, and your winner in Game 7 two years ago against the Leafs, the 5-4 goal, magic hands, fast hands. So what did you do as a kid to, to develop that? Yeah, I think just kind of fiddling around and um, obviously, you know, lots of practice time. So um, just kind of mess around the ice. We used to play this game actually in uh, in um, in school in Donnan and Bimmy Ridge is where I went to school here in Edmonton and it was called Tippin. It was a short, you know, short and ice probably just around the top of the circles. It was two on two. So it was a lot of in tight kind of um, games and we played every single morning. And uh, I got pretty good at the game. I got pretty good because if you score, you stay and everyone else had to wait. And so you compete, right? So um, I'd probably say, honestly, it's a testament to that is why I feel so comfortable around that, I guess, is because I put in hours and hours of work down there. But um, also just watching hockey, too, and just kind of the style that I play. Like, like you said, I didn't really think on those goals. Those are more just um, instinct and uh, very happy that I have that instinct, obviously. But um, I'd probably say it's from those tipping games in the morning. Go, go on about that, Louis. Yeah, you know, I think he's always had great hand-eye coordination, you know, and that was, it was funny. When, we're, when I was playing down in the farm team down in Norfolk in the American Hockey League, we were living in Virginia Beach right in the, on the beach, and I'm sure you remember this. Put him in baseball. We put him in every different sport. Same with Jordan. We put her in multiple different sports and events, dance, gymnastics. Just we wanted them to experience a lot of things. Um, hockey, obviously, was his favorite. But we, we wanted the kids to kind of broaden their horizons and be in different things. So baseball was relatively new to me. I didn't play baseball growing up. So Casey Hankinson on the team in Norfolk said, listen, you got to get his hand-eye coordination up and you got to throw, pitch him balls. Just keep pitching him balls, pitching him balls. So I went to the Walmart and I got one of those big, huge bags of whiffle golf balls because I thought, you know what, if he can hit this little golf ball, he'll be able to crush a baseball. And sure enough, it took a little bit of timing, but once he started to smack those golf balls, I'd throw a baseball in there every once in a while. It was a soft, hard ball. It wasn't a hard ball. It was actually a, a children's ball, but – he would crush it. So that, that, that hand-eye coordination has always been there for him. He picked that up very quickly. And, 
you know, Ryan, Ryan Smith was another player you watched growing up. You always loved the way Smitty drove to the net. And obviously, I would reinforce that, say, go to the dirty areas and score goals. But Ryan was one of those guys, along with Craig Simpson, who you mentioned earlier from the Oilers, that went to the front of the net to score goals. That's where you score goals, and that's where he scores a lot of his goals. And I think that's just from the players that he watched growing up, too. Yeah, you're in front of that uh, Freddie Anderson. You've given him fits for two years in a row. And, you know, the next year, oh, we can get into the Stanley Cup if you want. It must be painful to think about that seventh game. What a series, Jake. I, I cannot tell you how impressive it is to watch your Bruins. And obviously the Blues got you in the seventh. But um, you had uh, the big hit on Kadri in game one, drove him nuts. Then you crushed Marlowe and upset everybody, of course. Uh, I love that. And, Jake, I don't know if you get it from your dad, the wisdom that, you know, there are certain players in the league. Kadri's one of them, actually, and you're becoming one of them. And Matt Kachuk's one of them. And uh, Tom Wilson's obviously maybe the best at it. I don't know if you'd agree with that. But finding a way to be the skill guy you are, but also intimidate and uh, agitate. Tell me about how you learned to be that guy or do you think uh, about that? I think I learned it from one of my teammates, to be honest. Uh, Marcy's a pretty good agitator himself, so... <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, I, I honestly don't think my role is necessarily to agitate, but when it comes to playoff time, um, you definitely have to bring a different element. You know, you got to stand up for yourself, and it's a physical game out there. Um, and I felt throughout that series, I mean, especially at the start, I just felt like I was getting kind of uh, targeted in a sense. Obviously, I had a pretty good playoffs against them the year before. Um, and I didn't know if that was a game plan or just kind of how the game was working out, but um, I didn't like it, and I just wanted to kind of push back in a sense, and maybe I pushed back a little too far. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I thought that whatever happened out there was playoff style hockey. You know, that's all I was hearing at the time. So I was, I was game for it. And I kind of give a little bit of credit to, to my dad in the sense where I'm not going to back down from anything. Um, and, you know, even if you, you know, as much as you try to hit me or as hard as you do, I'm, I'm going to come back. I'm not necessarily afraid of anything. So um, that's kind of what happened, I guess, in the series. It was a pretty crazy start to the playoffs. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm happy we definitely won that series. That was, uh, that was a big win for uh, our team. Over to you, Louis. Yeah, you know, I, I've i always kind of preached that too. And, he, and he's right. I've always said, listen, you have to stick up for yourself. Funny story about Rick Tockett. The one thing he said to him when Jake was a smaller player playing in Phoenix, you know, he came up and said, here's a tip from Uncle Talk. Obviously, he's now coaching the Arizona Coyotes. But – he said, never take a clean hit. And, you know, that was such a mentality back in the day. The sticks were up high. A lot of guys still weren't wearing helmets back then. So when you got a hit, you got your stick up. Ray Bork was the best at it. You know, he could get that stick up and just build a fence, do it legally. If you wanted to hit him and really take a run at him, you're going to have to eat that stick. And it was just a way of protecting yourself, but also letting everybody know that you weren't going to take unnecessary punishment in the corners. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that I've always liked that style of game. I, I love the offensive and the, and, and the skill part of the game, the aspect that I lacked a lot of. Obviously, I gravitate towards that, and it's very special. I, I just am amazed every night at what the players do on the ice on a daily basis. But I always still think there's that element where you still have to play with passion, you have to play with energy, and sometimes you're going to have to play a little bit nasty. And that's just the way that I've always liked the game played. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. So let, let's talk one more thing about your Bruins. Amazing team. Uh, the leadership of Chara, uh, the shot of Marchand, never mind the, or that vision, but he, he used to put a piece of tape on the floor and he would shoot the puck so that he got the puck off before he crossed that piece of tape on the floor. Amazing release. What, what about you, Jake? What did you do to develop your shot? Yeah, I think that um, you take pointers from different guys. Marshy's one of those guys that, um, like you said, flings it. So, I mean, leading up to the the NHL, obviously just shooting all, shooting all the time, you know, shooting whether it's on the ice um, with Dustin Schwartz, the uh, Edmonton goaltending coach, or uh, shooting on goalies, you know, um, three or four times a week with shooting downstairs in the basement. Uh, I think just overall just trying to um, analyze certain guys, maybe one-timers or certain things, little details that you can pick up um, to get your shot in NHL ready, I guess. And then once you kind of get there, you watch guys, you know, we got – David Pasternak and our team can absolutely rip it from any point on the ice. You know, his, his radius for his shot is is crazy. So you ask him questions. You look at Marshy. Berge shoots it really well. You know, he shoots every puck like it's, you know, game seven, even in practice, he rips it. So uh, I think it's just consistently trying to put it through the net, um, literally on every single shot, whether it's in practice or, or downstairs, I think helps it. I still need to work on my shot. I think everyone would say the same thing, um, considering goalies are getting better, but – I, that's kind of my focus on it, and that's kind of what I did. Who did you uh, take into account when you developed your shot, Louie? You know, it's funny. Um, played in Stratford for the Stratford Culligans with Rick Olchuk, and his older brother, Ed, as a lot of people know, is a, 
uh, an, a tremendous hockey player now is an amazing analyst, but and good friends with the old Chucks Rick still to this day. But one of the things he would come down and spend time with Rick, so we would have you know the privilege of picking his brain and talking to him. He was in the National Hockey League at that time, playing for the Leafs. And you know, one of the things that always stood out that he told me back then was what Jake just said, and I tried to relay that, relay that to him as well: is shoot every time like it's in a game. In practice, when you come down, try and score every single time you shoot that puck. Number one, you're going to make your shot better. You're going to learn how to score, but you're also going to make your goaltenders better as well by shooting to score every time, making them stop difficult pucks. And that always stuck with me for some reason. It always stuck with me when he said that the fact that he would spend the time, that he would come down there to see his brother and sit around, let us hot stove with him. I never forgot that. And to this day, we just saw him in Chicago right in early March, right before this whole thing went on pause. And I brought up that story to him, and uh, he got a chuckle out of it. He probably doesn't remember saying it, but that's how influential these guys can be to young people when they talk to them. Those things stick with you, and uh, that one stuck with me. It's, you know, Denny and Joan Flanagan, uh, that Stratford Culleton program, and, and then Toronto, Olchek and Fergus and Clark and Aya Frady. I, I can't tell you, Felino, they could all just wire a puck. Louis, it was incredible, and you grew up watching a lot of that. Uh, Junior, I want to ask you, and then we'll get to Colby Cave, God love him. Uh, but Junior, first you, Louis, actually, because we know I, I saw Jake's Memorial Cup in Red Deer, of course, and London ends up winning it with Matt Kachuk, and Mitch Marner's on the show Friday, so I'll maybe get a thought on that, Jake, Mitch Marner. But you first, Louis, because you had an unbelievable 89 OHL run with the, the London. London Knights. It was, and it was one of those those years where we just continually got better right into the end of the season. And I think, you know, if you look at those series, they went seven games. They were long, grueling series, every single one of them. And then we ended up running to Niagara Falls in the conference final. And they beat us in seven. But it was a war. It was a different type of hockey back then. Bill LaForge, the coach of the Niagara Falls back, back then at that time, I'll tell you, every single game, it didn't matter who was winning or losing the game. If it was by more than two goals, look out. There weren't going to be a lot. There would be shrapnel all over the ice by the end of the game, and there would be half the bench left after it. But they were wars, and it was it was a great run. You know, that old London Garden out there uh, on the 401 was just a terrific building to play. And I know the opposition didn't like it coming in there, the colors, the green, the gold. But for us, that was our home, and we, uh, we loved playing in there, and we tried to make it as difficult as we could for anybody that came in there to play. And so, Jake, Brent Sutter and the Rebels, uh, you, had a, you had five shots in that semifinal game. Rowan Aranda had a goalie that, you know, turned into Patrick Roy or, you know, Kerry yeah. Price, right? Yeah. What do you remember about the Memorial Cup run? And then we'll get to Swift Iron. But first, the Memorial Cup. Mark. Yeah, the Memorial Cup was obviously a great opportunity. I think that any time you can kind of be on that stage, it's kind of for junior, it's the it's – um, where you want to be if you want to play for the Memorial Cup. And, um, you know, obviously as a host team, there was a lot of pressure on us. And, um, you know, I think we lost to Brandon in the third round there. So we were kind of had some time to, you know, get bag skated and stuff like that in the morning to get conditioned and things like that. But it was an amazing experience. And I'll never forget that with those guys. And obviously, like you said, we lost in the semifinals. But um, lots of learning lessons. It was kind of the first, um, you know, event for me personally I kind of felt uh, like a big event in a, in a sense you know I played in the prospects game and that was a big really big event at the time but that was one game this was more of a tournament style uh, of the best of the best at, at your age group so um, you know it was one of those things that uh, I wish it obviously went differently but uh, it was a lot of fun to be a part of and uh, I'll never forget that group of guys it was it was a lot of fun. Marner's on Friday did you want to chirp him? <laughs> no, I'll let, him, I'll let him go. I'll let okay. Him go. Yeah, that line was yeah. incredible. That line was so incredible yeah, but, in that term all year long, but in that term especially. Yeah, I mean, wreck, too, wow. Yeah. You take a penalty, you're getting scored on. Yeah. 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 Truly was. Uh, so that you got over to Red Deer from Swift Current, obviously, Jake. Uh, and that brings me to, it could be a couple of things, but let's start with Colby Cave and uh, your love and admiration for uh, the late Colby. Uh, we're all just heartbroken for Emily and the family. What, what do you think of when you think of Colby? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it, it, I still honestly can't believe it. I mean, just hearing the news that he was in the hospital, I remember waking up and uh, actually uh, our coach, uh, Bruce, called me and told me about it. And, um, you know, it's shocking. And obviously now, I mean, it's he, he was he was a really good guy. And I think you could see by just the amount of media support and um, people that care for him and all these stories are coming out. And, um, you know, he was just a really good guy. He was my first leader, uh, you know, coming in junior. And, um, you know, I've spent time with him from Swift Current to – Providence to, to Boston, all those development camps. I mean, we, we spent a good amount of time together. So he's a good friend of mine and uh, someone I can always lean on. Um, you know, I'm going to miss him. I still can't believe it. I don't really know how to talk about it. 
Um, you know, it's really sad though. I feel for, you know, obviously Emily and his family, it's something you never even expect to happen. So, um, you know, just really sad. He, he was a great leader and just a really good guy. You know, you hear all these stories about how he always has a smile on his face and um, that's when everyone saw him kind of at the dance, you know, whether it was the NHL or AHL, he's the same way in Swift. You know, that's the one thing is he never changed. He was always caver and um, he always had the best dance moves at the party. I know I'm going to miss those. So, um, you know, it's just really emotional and, uh, you know, it's sad to talk about. It's uh, one of those things you never want to have happen, especially to a good friend. Louis? Yeah, you know, I, I second those. And, I, and one of the things that stood out that you just said there, Jake, was that he never did change. You know, I met him when he was in junior, and obviously he was one of the veterans there when Jake stepped on board in Swift Current. Um, but, you know, just the way he, you know, handled himself, the way he presented himself, it was always a stiff handshake, look you in the eye, how you doing, Mr. Nebraska? And he never changed. Even now, as an Edmonton Oiler, recently shaking his hand, it was just like I was shaking his hand six, seven years ago. Um, amazing family. He was brought up very well, and just just an amazing, tra just a tragedy that you don't, you can't understand, you can't explain. And I think that's the part of it right now for everybody that hits hard so home is that there's just really no answer for it. And and and, and for us, um, you know, obviously the, the time that he spent with Jake, uh, this this hit the whole the whole hockey community, the whole world right now hard because of what we're all going through right now. And for uh, for the family, we think nothing but our prayers to them and thoughts for them because in this difficult time, because it's just something that you don't ever want to have happen. It's hard to picture support, right, when nobody can get together. And that's why they, the cars on the highway in the Battlefords, there's amazing stuff going on, but boy, it's difficult. So our love, uh, thanks. Oh, the last thing I'll do, I'll throw this at you. Um, when I was refereeing one night, your rookie year, so Mark Lamb, I should give shout out to Mark because he was coach uh, that gave the captaincy there in Swift Current. And obviously your rookie year in the NHL with the Evans and Oilers, Louis, you'd have played with Mark. Um, I remember being a referee one night, Wayne Maxner was now coaching St. Thomas in the United League and they had played the Brantford Smoke and after the game, I'm walking out of the ref's room and the goalie for the Brantford Smoke is being told he's getting called up to St. John's Newfoundland to replace Felix Potvin, who's getting called up to the Maple Leafs. He was thrilled beyond belief. It was David Schill. Does that name mean anything to you? David played goal for you in London. Yeah. 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 And just, I would love your Great character actually, Schiller. He was a yeah. <laughs> yeah, great goalie, and, and, and the thrill of that call up. So to think of Colby uh, and you playing together uh, in the NHL must have just been an amazing thing, Jake. Yeah, we actually started on the same line together. It was like uh, junior, you know. We were talking about it, and um, you know, we we played together as well during my draft year in Boston. He signed with Boston that year. You know, pretty much a year that changed both our lives um, for hockey reasons. You know, it was uh, special. You know, when he gets called up, and then uh, you know. Coach, he puts some, you know, right with me on the line. And I remember going to that face off. I'll never forget the face off. And I was like, just like the Swifty days, you know, that's something that no one can take from me or Colby. Um, and, you know, it's just, it was a really proud moment. Uh, I wish we played a little bit, you know, longer together, obviously, but things happen. And uh, it was probably my fault, but, um, you know, just, <laughs> just the, yeah, just the, uh, just the overall process of getting there. You know, I've seen how hard he worked. He's seen how hard I worked to get this point from, you know, the, you know, the swift current, you know, road trips, all that stuff. And to finally make it to the show and, um, you know, for us to play on a line together for the first game was something I'll never forget. I, I'll never forget his first goal even. I, I remember watching, I was hurt at the time actually. Um, I think it was against Montreal and uh, just how generally happy I was for, you know, my, uh, my good buddy and my teammate that, you know, I've seen go through some ups and downs himself, and um, we've been through a lot together. You know, you don't spend five plus years in the hockey world um, without dealing with some stuff. So, um, you know, just the, that experience itself was is something I'll never forget. And it's a gift at this point. You know, the, the game gave gave us a gift like that, and um, definitely something I'll remember him from. What a joy to listen to the two of you. Thanks, Louis. Thanks, Jake. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Friday's another very special show. Natalie Spooner and Mitch Marner, 7 o'clock Eastern and 4 Pacific. I remember when he was going into his Bantam draft, Jake DeBrusque's mom and dad, Cindy and Louie, listed him as 5'2", 125, when in fact he was 4'11 and 100 pounds. But they knew the way to do things. And that brings us to the song lyric, you can't break the rules until you know how to play the game. That's Ricky Lee Jones. Till Friday for all of us. Thanks for watching. So long.